Uh, it's great to see you guys this morning. A couple announcements before we dive back into the book of Hebrews. Uh, first of all, I want to give a, a huge just general thanks to all the people that made the Baptism Sunday possible. So if we can give a, a thank you to everybody who came out and cooked and was there. It was a blessing to be up there at Mazingo with uh, our, our friends from Calvary Chapel, Maryville. I saw 22 people b- baptized into Christ and just had a great sweet time of fellowship. So uh, God is always doing some new things in, in, new peop- in people's lives and that is a joy to see and to be a part of. And then second thing, That is really crucial, really important, time sensitive. If you are a woman, please raise your hand. I hope you know how to define what that is. Uh, Good. We uh, we're coming up on that deadline for uh, the women's retreat sign up. So you need to take care of that today. And I really would encourage you to carve out the time and and go to this. We have a very special guest speaker, Michelle Randall, who's uh, the the wife of Pastor John Randall in in, uh, Calvary South OC in California. Really wonderful people. And really, I think she's gonna bring a a very insightful and powerful word um, to the ladies uh, at the retreat. So uh, all the details for that retreat, the costs, the arrangements are all online at graceontheweb.org. You can go uh, on your way out at the information desk and get uh, signed up for that. And no doubt, it's going to be a refreshing and insightful and strengthening time for, for all you ladies. And so uh, please sign up for that. Okay, that being said, we are in Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. If you would open your Bibles there and stand with me as we read God's word. And this morning we are moving through four verses. And so we will uh, read together. I'll read the odd number of verses if you would join together on the even verses. Paul writes this. <clears throat> Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Lord, we pray that your word would go in us and through us and that it would not leave void or empty any space, Lord, that it would fill us completely and that our ears would be attentive to what the Holy Spirit might say through this living word of yours, uh, in, in regards to the things that you are challenging us with, encouraging us with, that are going on in our own lives. We know that you're able to do that, and, and so we look to you to speak. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> and you can have a seat. I want, to, I want to get you guys' response to this phrase, okay? The joy of running. The joy of running. Anybody? I, I tell you what, that just strikes me the wrong way. Now, I swam in high school and in college, and partially because I was good at it, and partially because I hated running. And so I didn't want to have anything to do with running. One of my best friends uh, tried to start to get me running again this last year, and uh, he said, oh, Josh, come on, you just, just, we'll just do it light. <laughs> so, okay. And before I even get out there, right, I'm like telling myself, my knees are going to hurt, and my, my throat's going to hurt, and my side's going to hurt, and I'm going to get tired, and everything's going to feel heavy, and this is going to be miserable. Like before I even started, right? So I'm already in the right set mindset. And then he starts to give me some tips, right? Oh, well, try, try putting your head like this when you breathe and try putting your feet up like this and we'll just, you know, just take your, take your time, build endurance. And so we, we started doing that and um, still hated it. And, but I, I, uh, about, about 
two months ago or so, I woke up one morning and the first thought that popped in my head is, I'm going to take a quick jog. And I, I had to kind of d- do a double take and go, wait a minute, <laughs> is, is that me? I don't know where that's coming from. And so I went out and I took a quick jog. And I didn't like it still. <laughs> but I had a lot of a good prayer time and so on and so forth. But, but I, I, you know, I, I am certainly not even close to the picture of discipline when it comes to running. It's been very inconsistent and I haven't, I've, I've ceased to do it since. <laughs> but um, I did start to recognize when I was doing it a little more consistently that as my body built endurance and as I started realizing some of the goals and some of the benefits and started seeing like where this could ultimately lead, that there was almost this dichotomy of like, yeah, this is hard, but there's something I enjoy about it. There's something that I look forward to about the end result of it. And while certainly, again, this is not a message about physical exercise, because at the top of the list, at the top of the list of our disciplines and our pursuits and our, the races that we run in life is this race that we're all in, the spiritual race. It is a race and a run of faith towards Jesus, towards heaven, that is not an option for the Christian. It's not, well, if you like this event, you can do it, and if not, we'll just put you on the bench. Or you can, you can be on the bench. That's not, not where God wants you. That's not where God intends for you to be when it comes to the race of faith. And this race of faith will be sacrificial. At times it will be painful. At times it will literally push you to your limits. But it's also worth it. And there is joy in running because we know what is at the finish line. And so the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12 is an exhortation to run the race of faith how we do it, why we do it, and who we're doing it for. And Paul outlines four essential preparations that we need to equip ourselves with to run the race that God has put before us effectively. So we're going to dive right in. If you're jotting down your notes, number one is this. To run your race effectively, Paul tells us we need to know who our audience is. We need to know our audience. Notice in verse 1. He says, therefore, coming off a chapter where he talked about all of the heroes chronologically of faith that ran their race of faith. And he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses, let us run. And so right there, he says, I want you to know your audience. And the picture immediately in Paul's mind is Roman Colosseum or amphitheater where there are sporting events, they called them circuses back then, and they were quite circuses. It's recorded at one chariot race, 30,000 of the, of the attendees died uh, due to riots and you know, political arguments. I, I don't know if we could even envision that happening and like, well, like a, go to a Chiefs game and everyone's like pulling out their knives and guns and everything, it's crazy. But Paul is witnessing here this idea where all eyes are on the participants, on the athletes who are about to participate in this sport. And he here speaks about the great cloud of witnesses. There are several interpretations here. Some say that the great cloud of witnesses is a- are angelic or spiritual beings, right? Angels and demons who are observing the Christian's life to see whether or not they're running their race of faith. And Certainly that's not completely untrue, but I think the context is evident. Remember, when Paul wrote this, he didn't write it in chapter breaks. It was all one continuous letter. And so he just got done talking about all of the heroes of the faith and the races they ran believing in this God that they could not see and despite all odds against them and despite the loss of all things, even to their lives, they left us an example And I believe that Paul is saying these that we just read about are our great cloud of witnesses. I don't know if you've ever flown, but sometimes when you're ascending or descending into a plane and you go into a cloud layer, what's all that you see? You're just surrounded by cloud. It's only cloud. 
And that's, that's what Paul wants us to know. There is an immense, innumerable number of saints who have gone before us who showed us what it's like to successfully and joyfully live a life of faith even through the trials and difficulties that you will experience in life. And it's almost a sense that they are there cheering you on, saying, you've got this, you can do this. And not merely by metaphorically, like their life is an example. But the language here implies we are surrounded. In other words, they're alive. Their, their person from heaven, almost in a sense, encourages and exhorts us and cheers us on in our pursuit of a life of faith. In a modern race, athletes are surrounded by fans and spectators who will cheer them on or boo them or idolize them. But this isn't what Paul had in mind. When Paul thinks of this, I want you to think of like being a baseball player. It's one thing to be a baseball player and go out in front of like thousands of fans. But what if you're a baseball player and you go out and the stadium is filled with all of the greatest baseball players of all time? Mickey Mantle, Babe Ruth, Roger Clemens, Ty Cobb, Hank Aaron, Barry Bonds, you name it. If they achieve something successful in baseball, they're all there watching you, right? You feel a little different weight than you do going in front of the fans that might throw something at you or cheer you or boo you. You are now in the presence of people who have succeeded at what you're doing. And there's a weight, there's a motivation there that you feel. Notice the word witnesses here. It's the Greek word martus, where we get the English word martyr. Literally, those who have given their life to the very end for their faith. We are surrounded by people that didn't just merely trust God, but they trusted God until the very end, with some of them even their lives. What kind of motivation is that? What kind of encouragement is that? To say they did it, and we too now have an obligation to do it. I think looking at our audience challenges us in four ways. When we read Hebrews 11 and we see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Jephthah and Samson and David and Noah and uh, 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 Enoch, we see these people and it should inspire four things in us. Number one, their example of faith should inspire us to trust God more. I don't know if you struggle at all at times with God's motive, God's provision, God's guidance, whether or not this path is going to get you where you need to go. Their lives tell us that God is always faithful. He is worthy to be trusted. Number two, their example of faith challenges us to no longer live in apathy, right? You read about these guys, and it's not like they had half-hearted commitments to God, They were all in with everything they had, everything they owned, everything they were. So it doesn't allow us when we read about their lives to say, you know, God, I'll set my terms. I'll set my level of comfort. I'll set the boundaries in which I will follow you. No, it inspires us to never be in a place where we're comfortable, but we're always pushing the limits of faith so that we are in positions to trust God. Number three, their example of faith reminds us what the ultimate goal is. The ultimate goal is not success and achievement and possessions on earth. The ultimate goal is to finish our course that when Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant, we know that with everything that was within us, we lived for eternity. We pursued heaven and the purposes of God. And then, of course, their example of faith reminds us that the cause of Jesus is worth everything. It's worth everything. And so as we look at these martyrs, these witnesses, we're surrounded by their stories and their testimonies and their life, and they cheer us on and they encourage us when we're weak and they strengthen us. And so we need to know that we have an audience that is watching us and that we are not alone in the race. But number two, in order to run this race effectively, we need to know our limitations. We need to know our limitations. Look at it as he continues. It says, therefore, because we're surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses, let us take action. What's the action? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. The command here to lay aside is frequent in Scripture, especially in the New Testament. It's the same exact word that Paul uses when he says to cast off the works of darkness 
or to put off the old man and all of its works and all of its lusts and all of its deeds. It, it, the word means a violent casting off or a violent throwing away. And here he says to lay aside two things, the weight and the sin that so easily entangles us. Now, he differentiates weight and sin because they are two different things, and he wants us to know that they are two different things. But here's what it tells me overall. I'll get into the specifics. But that one of the key elements to living the Christian life, listen carefully, is the willingness to get rid of stuff that is keeping you from God's best. That is a necessary element of the Christian life. The willingness to get rid of stuff that is keeping you from God's best. And notice he says weights and sin. When we look at the idea of a weight, what is a weight? Well, sin is obvious, right? We know what sin is. It's anything that is done in disobedience to God, correct? Right, it's, it's, it's morally wrong, it's ethically wrong, it's biblically wrong, we understand this, it's sin. Well, what is a weight? Here is the hard thing about weights. Weights are not necessarily bad things, but they're not necessarily the best things. They are things that are easier to excuse because it's like, well, it's not like I'm doing anything wrong. Yeah, but are you freed or without hindrance to run the race that God wants you to run without being tied up, without being hindered, without being wearied by things that God doesn't want you to carry? Most of the time, we get tired in following Jesus, not because the weight of Jesus is too much, but because we put too many weights on ourselves that Jesus has not asked us to carry. This is why Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What did he say? My yoke is easy and my burden is so heavy that it's going to smash you. No. It's light. You know what causes heaviness in life? It's when we become weighed down with unnecessary cares and anxieties and pursuits that keep us from experiencing the freedom and the joy of fully following Jesus without hindrance. When I swam competitively and started competing at higher and higher levels and going to finals and winning medals, I did something that when I was a freshman in high school and just started swimming, I swore I'd never do. I shaved. My chest, my stomach, my legs, my feet, my arms, my armpits, every visible piece of hair was gone. (laughs) That's silly. Not if you want to win a race, it's not silly. Because you begin to realize that hundreds of seconds count between the winner and the loser. And anything that that causes drag, anything that causes a hindrance has to go. You have to modify your suit. You have to get the latest technology. You have to... and, And all people who play sports competitively who want to win understand this concept. You do things not to put extra hindrances on you. You might train with weight, but you're not gonna look at the Olympic 100 meter final and see a guy there with ankle weights on. Back in the Roman times, please forgive the the image, don't spend too much time trying to imagine it, but we all know that Greek runners and Roman runners ran naked. They got up to the line, the clothes went off. Why? Because the last thing you want is to be going around a corner and you get tripped up on your robe. The idea of running is anything that causes me to be hindered or an extra weight or a burden or to become weary has to go so I can focus on the task at hand, and that is winning the race. My, my same friend who got me running, Adam, I mean, I'm not saying any names over here, he also taught me about rucking. You guys know what rucking is? Maybe if you're in the military, you know. It's when you uh, do a fast-paced walk with, you know, a 50-pound backpack with weights in it on your back, you know, and you start off, right? And you're just like, I got this, no problem. And then a mile and a half in, you're like, that's starting to burn. (laughs) Starting to, and you just, but, but here's what's fun. When you get back and you're done, you get that feeling. You take the, you take the backpack off 
and all of a sudden, like, you feel like you're going to, like, take off. You're just, like, so light. Like, ah, I could just run. And I could... Why? Because when sometimes you don't realize how heavy a weight is until it's off your back. And many times we need to be those people who say, you know what, Lord, help me take an honest assessment of the weights I'm carrying that are burdening me, that are hindering me from the race that is before me. And here, notice this word. It's, it's a small word, but it's important. It says, let us lay aside how many weights? Every weight. Every weight. In other words, we don't get to pick and choose, and many of us are guilty of half-hearted surrender. That's what I call it, half-hearted surrender. I give God just enough to ease my conscience, but not enough to fully submit to his plan and will for my life. But every weight must go. Now, I hear some people, okay, Josh, now you're going to tell me what the weights are, right? Nope. Because I don't know what your weights are. The Holy Spirit and you know what the weights are. What might be a weight for that person might not be a weight for that person. And what might be a weight for you might not be a weight for another. What you have to do, what this forces us to do is it, it takes, we take an honest assessment of how we're running our race. And, we, and then we see, oh, you know, I thought the Lord wanted me to do this, but, but that was the day I really wanted to do this. And all of a sudden, the tension starts to pull. And we feel that pull, and we feel that weight, we feel that extra burden. And it takes faith, doesn't it? To take a weight that you have become accustomed to, and that you feel like is freedom, and that you really like, and cast it aside from you, trusting that what God has is better for you. That takes faith. And then he says, not only the weight, but the sin that so easily entangles. Sin here refers to any moral failure that puts us outside of God's express will. These are the things that tempt us with the lust of the flesh and the lust of our eyes and the pride of life. But perhaps the most sobering word in this entire passage for me is this word, easily. Do you see that word there? Mark it in your Bible. The sin that so easily entangles or ensnares us. In other words, the author understands something about human beings. It doesn't take much for us to get messed up and tangled up in sin, does it? Sin is so deceitful and it's so patient and it's so alluring that if we are not completely on guard, fully dressed in the armor of God, walking in the truth, we can, before we know it, be tangled within sin. I was, I was, I was mowing my yard yesterday, another pastime I love to do. I was mowing my yard yesterday and I went in between a couple trees and all, I mean, it took like split second. You know the spider webs that are like not the, the you like, <laughs> like stretching everywhere with like those big spiders in the middle of them? All, I mean, I'm all up in it. And what do I try to do? I'm trying to, you know, and every, every move I make, I'm getting more tangled up in the stupid spider web. But is this not exactly what happens to the person walking in disobedience to God? Every step further you take into it, a little more stuck you get in sin's web. Romans 6.16, 6, Paul puts it like this. Do you not know that whom you present yourselves to uh, whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered and have been set free from sin because, and you became slaves of righteousness." This is a powerful thought because he says when you put your faith in Christ, all of a sudden the power that raised Jesus from the dead 
of the Holy Spirit lives in you, and here's one of the greatest lies of the enemy to the Christian. Sin is so strong that you cannot get free from it. That is not true. That is unbiblical. Now, it is biblical to say, because I am a person who is in the flesh, I will continue to struggle with temptation. I will continue to struggle with sin. I'm being sanctified. I'm not going to be perfected. But sin does not have to have a grasp on me. I let it have a grasp on me. And that's what a lot of people need to hear today. I'm not saying, don't hear me wrong, are there complexities to being wrapped up in sin? Yeah, when you're in it, it feels like, man, if I do this, uh, this is gonna happen, and if I try to do this, this is gonna happen, and what about this, and what about that? It takes faith to trust God enough that if you do it his way, it's gonna be better. I know we're not married yet, and we're living together, and, you know, but it's complicated. There's kids, and there's money, and there's passing, and there's this and that. And well, are, you, are you sleeping together? Oh, yeah. So you're saying you want to enjoy the benefits of the covenant of marriage under God's sight without making the commitment. That says you don't trust God, but you still want it your way. Do it God's way. You want joy in the marriage? You want to bring God's presence in the family? You want to find God's way of getting you to where you need to be? Then do it God's way. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I just bring up one example, right? This can apply to obviously any sorts of things that we tend to excuse when it comes to sin because we think we know better than God. Or ultimately, it's because we just want something more than we want God. I can't stop doing this thing. No, you want it more than you want God. Be honest with yourself. If someone was holding a gun to your head and said, you better not do that or I'm pulling the trigger, I think all of a sudden you'd probably find, I can stop. <laughs> it comes down to a matter of our affections. We're battling, it's a, sin is a battle of affections. It's the desire of our flesh versus the desire of our spirit. And here, Paul says, if you want joy in the run and freedom in the race, and you want to experience the fullness of everything God has for you this side of heaven, get rid of the weights, get rid of the sin, or maybe I can just sum it up like this, that anything that is bent on your destruction is not worth holding on to. It's not worth it. Let it go. I don't want to pound uh, this topic of sin, but I think I need to finish up with this thought. How does sin ultimately lie to us? Well, I think, number one, sin promises fulfillment and it leaves you empty. John 10, Jesus said, the thief only comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I've come to give you life. So the, the thief comes to take things out of you, Jesus comes to put things into you, but, but have you noticed that Satan, every time you're tempted, promises you that he's there to fill you, but he leaves you empty. Sin, number two, promises no consequences, but leaves you with devastation every single time. And this is a lie that permeates our culture. You can be who you want to be. You can do what you want to do. Whatever feels right to you, right? There's not even a, it's not even anymore today. It's not even like your truth, my truth. It's like, we don't want truth. We just want whatever feels good and whatever feels right. I have the right to be that and to do that. You're right, you do. And it's exactly what Satan wants you to believe. So when you do it and when you proclaim it and when you are it, you are left enslaved, broken, damaged, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. That is sin's intent. Number four it is that sin promises you freedom but leaves you enslaved and it promises not to ever affect your relationship with God but it leaves you relationally devastated. These are all the truths about sin. So next time that apple looks really good, just remember that the other side of that apple is death. But the other side of obedience is life. So we need to know our, our limits to get rid of the things that hinder us in the race. Number three, we'll move through these last two points, is that we need to know our strength. 
We need to know our strength. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Underline that word endurance. It's the quality or the attribute of the way that we are to run. Anyone who's ever run a race knows that there is an inevitable moment that your body does what? It says, stop, you're killing me. We were not designed to do this. <laughs> Just knock it off. Right? Your body's telling you this is it. This is, this is, I've, I've reached the limit. Well, how do you press through a limit? It's called endurance. In fact, the word here, it means literally patient continuance. Isn't that everyone's favorite word, patience? You guys have heard it said, and I've said it before, right? Uh, be careful what you pray for. If you pray for patience, God will give it to you. I've got news for you. You don't have to pray for it. If you're following Jesus, it's a non-negotiable. <laughs> you have to get it any way possible. Patience is the way we endure through life. Patient continuance. A disappointment comes up, I press through it. An unexpected turn on the course, I move through it. I keep going beyond my limits. And of course, the race of faith is not a sprint, it's a marathon. You must continue running for Christ through the turns of trials, through the ditches of disappointment, and through the hills of hardships. And Pete, uh, James told us this, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And here is the author's point, that inevitably, along your race of faith, there will come a point in time when you're tempted out of frustration, weariness, or discouragement to give up the races that God has set you on. If you're honest with me today, you would probably raise your hand and say at some point, in a small way or great, I have felt like I think I, think I just want to stop. I think it would be easier to sit down on the side of the track than to keep trying to press through. And yet the author here takes us back to what he said in chapter 10 when he emphasized, for you have need of endurance that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And so don't give up and don't give in when it comes to the things that God has placed before you. Second Timothy, Paul writes, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. In other words, to win our race, we must run God's way. And notice here he says, run with endurance what? The race that is set before you. As Christians, we all have two, at least two races. Number one is the big, I call it the big R race. This is the race of faith. We are all on the same track. We are all running this race together. And what's the race? Stay faithful to Jesus Christ until I die. That's the race. When Paul's told Timothy, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the what? The faith. That's the race he's talking about. I kept the faith. I finished the race of faith. That's the big race. But then there's a secondary race, and that is the individual races that God has given each one of us. You don't have the same race I have. I don't have the same calling you have. You might not have the exact same direction and course and path, course and path that I have, and I might not have the one that you have. We all have been given individual races to run, and this is what Paul meant when he spoke in Acts chapter twenty. Listen, he says, "None of these things move me, nor do I count my life as dear to myself, that I may finish my race with joy." And the ministry I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. So Paul says, I want to finish the big race of faith, and I want to run and finish my race with joy. That God has given me a ministry and called me to do something specific in his kingdom. How would I apply this, well, friend? Four words. You have a race to run, six words. You have a race. If you don't feel 
like you're running for a purpose of Jesus, you need to get off the bench and say, coach, throw me in. If you look at your life and you're like, my life doesn't really consist of any actions, any ministries, any movement towards the purposes of God's kingdom. Like I have a life and I do stuff, but it doesn't really involve, I have a ministry from Jesus. You need to get your ministry from Jesus. Well, I don't think Jesus has a ministry for me. He does. God is not like the kind of coach where, we were talking about this the other day, the kind of coach that's like, you have a whole team of players, and then you have one like really tall kid on the basketball team, and the coach is just like, just give it to Johnny. Just give the ball to Johnny. Johnny, just don't, just, just, if you get the ball, just give it to Johnny. It's not what God's up to. God didn't say, I have a plan for Pastor Josh to make him a pastor, but not for so-and-so. They don't have very much to offer me. My friends, I've said this before. I'll say it again. None of us have anything to offer God. No degrees, no amount of intelligence, no clarity of speech, no charisma. charisma, no. None of us have anything to offer God that would make us more, should I say, more qualified to be used by him. What we do have to offer him is our obedience, our faith, our availability, and our willingness. If you can say yes, well, I don't know what to do. This is what I always tell people when they tell me, I don't know what ministry to do. Start with what you know. Well, what do I know? The greatest among you shall be the servant of all. If you don't know what to do, here's a tip. Go start serving somebody else in the name of Jesus. You don't need to take a spiritual, I get to take my spiritual gift test. I got the gift of helps and, oh, the gift of miracles, yeah. No, here's what you need to do. Stop taking spiritual gift tests and go start doing something. That requires spiritual gifts. And God will either say, eh, that's not, that's not quite your area. Or I'm going to empower you right now because you took a step of faith and you didn't think you would want to do that. But all of a sudden, you wouldn't want to rather be doing anything else. Start to find the ministry that God has given you, the race that he has set before you, and run that race with endurance to the finish line. But Josh, I fell on my face during the race. Get back up. I took a wrong turn on the track. Retrace your steps and go back and start again. I'm just so weary. Then rest in the Lord and regain your strength. I'm all tangled up in sin. Then then get the help of of other believers to start untying the knots. I'm all alone. Then start running the race with other like-minded Christians. But what we don't have the option is to say, I'm not gonna run the race. I love how William Barclay describes this endurance. Look at these words he uses. Speaking of this endurance, he says, that determination, unhasting, unresting, unhurrying and yet undelaying, which goes steadily on, which refuses to be deflected. Obstacles will not daunt it. Delays will not depress it. Discouragement will not take its hope away. It will halt neither for discouragement from within nor opposition from without. That is the endurance we need. And finally, number four, we need to know our Savior so here's the picture, okay? Stick with me, last point. He's, he's given us all these preparations, and now you're a lean, mean, running machine. I mean, you, you, are, you are set, you've cast out the sins and the weights, and you're healthy, and you are, and you are building endurance. You're ready to run the race, and you've identified a path and a course. Now comes the big and the overarching, the most important question. Who are you running for? Who are you running for? And so he says in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, you and I, we're running for Team Jesus. Amen? 
Like he is our, our coach, but also our example and also our goal. He's the one we're running towards. He's the one we're following. Our eyes must be steadily fixed. Our focus zoned in on Christ. There are many disciplined people in this world who are running effectively after stuff. Would you agree with me? There are a lot of people who have mastered themselves to accomplish their dreams in this life. I, uh, confession, I like watching boxing videos sometimes. And this, this clip came up, I don't know how, but it was Mike Tyson, the great philosopher and thinker of our day. Mike Tyson was talking to these guys and it just was like a little clip of the interview. And they were talking to him about, you know, what, what do you do with your free time? And he said, Mike Tyson, Iron Mike provided some of the wisest biblical words. I was, I was like, wow. He said, I don't have a phone. And the guys were like, what? You don't have a phone? Yeah, because I know the lower part of my nature. If I had a phone, I'd look at porn. And I'm out to conquer the world. If I, how can I conquer the world if I can't conquer myself? Hey, he's getting biblical on us. Why do I bring it up? Because here's the tragedy of it all. What's his goal? To conquer the world? Which he's not going to do, but even if he did, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? A lot of people are running for a lot of stuff effectively, but our call is to run for Jesus, to have our eyes fixed on him. When I was learning how to drive, I think I scared my dad more than once because I had this horrible habit. It seems like no matter which way I turned my head, the car turned the same way. (laughs) And if I had to change the lane and look over my shoulder all of a sudden, I was changing lanes while I was looking over my shoulder. Why? Because you move the direction you look. That's how it works in life. And that's how it works in faith. You move towards the things that you are fixing your gaze upon, that you're putting your focus on. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. And then he says, all athletes are disciplined in their training And they do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Paul says, I will put an athletic mindset on my faith. I will discipline my body. He just means that he will train and get his flesh under control. And he will run with intention. He will not shadow box just swinging at the air. He's going to have direction. He's going to have intentionality. He's going to be focused. He's going to be disciplined. But why? So that I could gain something on this earth that's going to pass pass away? No. Because my crown, my purpose, my goal, my investments are things that will never fade away. And that's how we ought to look at our faith. Of course, he says there's two reasons why. Looking unto Jesus, he says, the author and the finisher of our faith. In other words, Jesus is the one who writes our story. He wrote the first opening chapter. He writes the last final chapter. He sees your life through from beginning to end. But this word finisher, the author, that's the beginning, and the finisher, the word is actually perfecter. Your Bible might say the perfecter of our faith. I love this idea of Jesus being the perfecter of our faith because it tells me that your faith will never grow into what it needs to be if you're not staying focused on Jesus. He's the one who is going to perfect your faith. Do you remember that Peter learned this the hard way, or should I say the, the wet way? Peter had enough faith to see Jesus walking on the water in the middle of a storm, and he had enough faith to say, Lord, if that's you, call me out. And then he had enough faith when the Lord actually said, Peter, come to step out of the boat in the midst of a storm. And then he had enough faith to take several steps as though the water was solid ground as he walked towards Jesus. At what point did 
Peter's faith falter? When he started to look at the storm rather than look at the Savior. Whenever you decide you're going to look at the storm rather than look at the Savior, your faith starts to plummet. Your doubt starts to increase. Your natural fears of what's going to happen and your logic start to take over. And you begin to doubt God. You see, it's very important to remember this, that storms don't perfect your faith. Jesus perfects your faith. Now, he can use a storm, but I've seen people, two different people, go through the same storm and come out differently. And it all depends on whether or not they kept their eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes on Jesus, friend. Jesus can use a storm to test and to strengthen us, but our faith only grows when we don't turn away from Christ. And perhaps you are sinking even now. Then maybe you have the faith to do what Peter did. Even at that last moment as he was descending into the sea, he still had the faith, didn't he? To say, Jesus, save me. And Jesus said, I will. And he reached down his hand and pulled Peter to where he was. Perhaps there needs to be a cry of faith from some life, some heart here today. Simply, you're at the bottom, you're at the end. You want to give up your race. The Lord is, did not bring you here by accident, but by his spirit is calling out to you. Just reach out to me. Of course, Jesus then doesn't merely ask us to endure. He showed us, he demonstrated endurance for us, didn't he? Because it says here that he endured the cross, despising the shame. Same kind of words Paul is using for us. Endure, but, but Jesus endured. Something far more <laughs> unimaginable than anything you could ever endure. When Jesus thought of the cross, he despised the shame. The shame was not anything he did wrong. It was our shame, our nakedness, our sin that he embraced. The pain of physical suffering beyond comprehension, the darkness and aloneness that he experienced as he suffered the wrath of God for us on the cross. What caused Jesus to finish his course, to finish his race? The Bible says that the joy set before him, he endured the cross. To see, the joy was not the cross, it was the crown that would follow. It wasn't the suffering, but the salvation that would be extended. It wasn't the wrath he would suffer in a moment. It was the peace that we would have with God for eternity. God, Jesus looked ahead beyond the suffering, beyond the pain, beyond the trial, and he, he saw the finish line, and he knew that there was great joy ahead of him because I know it's hard for us to believe this, but part of his joy was your face. And knowing that that cross would seal forever your eternity with him. And did you know that there is a joy set before you today? Oh, you don't know my life. It's not very joyful. It's really hard. A lot going on. No, 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 no. Look beyond. Look past it. The joy set before you is that you have a Savior who ran his race, finished his race, rose from the dead, sat at the right hand of God victorious over all, including death, and you know what's going to happen to you one day is, is what happened to Stephen when he was stoned. I'm not saying you're going to get stoned. But when Stephen was stoned to death, what did he, he looked up and he said, Behold, I see Jesus, Son of God, standing at the right hand. of Jesus stood and welcomed him into the joy of the Lord. Remember the psalm that tells us, in your presence is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There is a joy set before you. It's heaven, it's eternity, it's meeting Jesus face to face, it's being free of sin and free of death and free of tears and free of pain in new bodies for all eternity, experiencing newness and joy every single moment in the presence of a perfect God. That's your joy. And Jesus shows us that example of how to run with joy. So, this morning, we are exhorted to run our race. And when we feel like we want to give up and we're crying out for help, 
We need to remember these four things. You have an audience. You have those heroes of faith who went before you, who demonstrated the, res- the resolve and the results of faith. You have their lives to look at, and they cheer you on. And then also remember that if there's anything holding you and hindering you, it's better to get rid of it than to hang on to it. For the Lord wants you to run freely the race he set before you, And that's, of course, going to number three, require endurance. And endurance must be be built. We must allow God to build patience in our lives by trusting him through trials. And that will allow us to continue pursuing the things he's placed in front of us, even in the face of difficulty and impossibility. And then, of course, lastly, our focus must be honed in on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who is with us in the race. So if you are running weary, tired, I want to pray just for you today. And perhaps you don't know Jesus, and this whole thing has been like, you know, this is not really making a lot of sense to me. I would encourage you to come join the race. (laughs) You might say, whoa, after what you described, why would I want to join that race? Because you're, everyone's in a race. You know that. You're already in a race. But the place you're running, it's going to lead you to destruction. Without Jesus, what are you running for? It's not going to last. And so come, run the race of faith. Receive the reward at the end of your life. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for the truth that's in your word. It challenges us, it exhorts us, it calls us to go deeper and to deeper places with you and to greater steps of faith. It calls us, Lord, to honestly examine our lives, the way that we're running, what we're running for, what we're running to. Lord, these are good things because you put this here to bring us into a place of freedom, of hope, of joy, of effectiveness and fruitfulness for the kingdom until you return. And so, Lord, I just pray for my brothers and my sisters. I pray for our church as a whole. I pray, Lord, that you would give us your vision, that you would put the race before us and that we would stay focused on the path that's ahead of us. There's so much to be done, Lord. So many battles to fight, so many needs to be served, so many people that need Jesus. And we want to be on course. We want to be on track to do our part. We love you, Lord, and we know that this is not possible apart from the empowering of your Holy Spirit. So we ask you to fill us now and strengthen us for the race ahead. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.